Malala often reflects on how different her world is now. England is a stark contrast to her home in Pakistan's Swat Valley. When she closes her eyes, she remembers. It was the 9th of October, 2012. She was travelling home from school in the bus, only a five-minute journey. When two young men waved the bus down, Malala thought they might be journalists. At 15 years old, she was already well-known for her fearless campaign for girls' education. But they weren't journalists. One of them leaned through the back window and fired three shots at point-blank range. Malala and two of her schoolmates, Shazia and Kanat, were all hit. Malala slumped forward into her best friend Maniba's lap, unconscious and bleeding. The Taliban thought they could silence Malala by shooting her. Safe to say, their plan backfired. But this is only part of Malala's story. Let's rewind. When Malala was born, her father, Ziauddin, knew there was something special about her. Ziauddin wanted his daughter to be well-educated and free as a bird. He was always passionate about education and clung to his vision of building a modern, well-equipped school for boys and girls. This was controversial in a region where young women were expected to stay in perda or seclusion in their homes. In neighbouring Afghanistan, the Taliban had been in control since 1996 and were already burning girls' schools. They implemented their extreme interpretation of Islamic law by brute force and it wouldn't be long before they infiltrated Swat Valley and Malala's hometown of Mingora. Would Ziauddin be able to keep his promise of freedom to Malala? After 9-11, thousands of men from Swat Valley went to fight with the Taliban in Afghanistan. There was even a bit of local hero worship going on for Osama bin Laden, the world's most notorious terrorist. Militant ideology started simmering in Swat Valley. When Ziauddin's beloved Kushal school became a reality, some local mullahs wanted to shut it down. These self-styled Islamic scholars didn't like the way the boys and girls mixed. Some even labelled the school haram, or forbidden. When a catastrophic earthquake struck in 2005, killing and injuring thousands, the mullahs took advantage. They declared that it was God's punishment for allowing women too much freedom in Pakistan. So when the Taliban showed up in Swat Valley in 2007, many welcomed them as saviours. But not Ziauddin. He was onto them. He openly criticised their local leader, Maulana Fazlullah, who broadcast his fiery sermons via an illegal radio station. Ziauddin warned people that Fazlullah was just a high school dropout whose real name wasn't even Fazlullah. But they didn't listen. Soon, the Taliban started enforcing their beliefs through murder and intimidation. Ziauddin's school was threatened again and many businesses in the valley had to close. Fazlullah then declared that all young women in Swat should be in Purda. This led to his minions blowing up girls' schools at night. In 2008, Ziauddin became the spokesperson for a group of activists who challenged Fazlullah the radio mullah. Malala attended the meetings, bringing tea and listening quietly. She absorbed everything like a sponge. Soon, she began her own campaign for peace and girls' education. This drew quite a lot of media attention. Even as the Taliban became more barbaric with public whippings and executions, Malala stayed committed to her cause. She knew that God would protect her. Not to mention her dad had her back the whole time too. 
That's what dads are for, right? In 2009, tensions between the Taliban and Pakistan's military became unbearable. There was a mass exodus from Swat Valley, so the Yusafzais decided to leave. They bounced from city to city for three months until the government said it was safe to return. As they drove back through the valley, they were shocked by the damage. Thankfully, their home was still intact, but army soldiers had left a mess in the school. Apparently, the Taliban had been cleared out. But Fazlullah was still on the loose. At least Mullah FM had been taken off the airwaves. In 2010, after a brief period of peace, massive floods devastated the region. Soon after this, it became obvious that the Taliban had never really left the valley. The bombings and killings started again, and people, even in the government, freely expressed extremist views. Throughout it all, Malala and Ziauddin continued their campaign for peace and education. When Ziauddin received a death threat from Fazlullah's henchmen, he laid low for a few weeks. But then it was back to business. In 2011, there was big news. US Navy SEALs had found and killed Osama bin Laden in his home. And guess where he'd made a cosy home for nine whole years? In Pakistan. This was humiliating for Pakistan's government. It made it look as though Pakistan was a safe haven for terrorists. Meanwhile, Malala continued to speak regularly and receive prestigious awards. She even had a school named after her. But it was real change she wanted not more medals and trophies in her cabinet. In 2012, the Taliban made a direct threat against Malala's life. This made Malala more cautious, but she still didn't abandon her campaign or her studies. In fact, exam revision was on her mind when she was shot on that awful day in October. She doesn't even remember hearing the shots or feeling the bullet enter her body. News of the attack spread quickly, and Ziauddin was soon by his daughter's side in the hospital. The bullet had passed through her forehead without touching her brain. She was alive. The other girls, Shazia and Kanat, had also been injured, but not critically. Malala was airlifted to a military hospital, where she was operated on and put in an induced coma, Her brain had started to swell, and she was still in danger of losing her life. Meanwhile, the Taliban claimed responsibility for the attack by order of Fazlullah. That villain! When Malala's condition started to deteriorate, two British doctors stepped in. They transferred her to another hospital where she received better intensive care. Finally, Malala stabilised. Phew. Malala's family stayed in a guarded military hostel nearby. When Ziauddin opened the newspaper, he was struck by the international outcry over the shooting. Even President Obama had chimed in. It soon became obvious that if Malala was going to recover properly, she would need treatment overseas. General Kayani was calling the shots, so he decided that Malala would be transferred to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham, England. Five days after the shooting, Malala woke up. But she had no idea where she was, what had happened to her or where her family were. Her vision was very blurry and she couldn't speak because of a tube in her neck. Malala was soon told where she was and given a pen and paper to communicate with. One of the doctors called Malala's family so she could hear their voices. They were still in Pakistan and it would be almost two weeks before they were reunited. When Malala saw herself in a mirror, she was shocked and asked, Who did this to me? 
It was at this point that Malala's doctor told her some details about the shooting. She didn't hold any bad feelings towards her attacker. She just wanted to go home. Soon, well wishes started flooding into the hospital, even from Beyonce and Angelina Jolie. This sent the media into a frenzy and made Malala's campaign go viral. When Malala was finally reunited with her family, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. Her parents tried to hide it, but they were obviously worried about her face. It would take another surgery and three more months before Malala got movement back in the left side of her face. When Pakistan's president, Asif Zadari, came to visit Malala, some important announcements were made. Not only would his government pay for her treatment, but they would also rent a home for the family and give Ziauddin a secure diplomatic job in Birmingham. This meant they could all stay in the UK. Hooray! In January 2013, almost three months after the attack, Malala was finally discharged from the hospital. Freedom at last! Although it was generally safer and more orderly, life in the UK would take some getting used to. When Malala started school in April, she was relieved to not feel fear, but she sorely missed her old school friends, especially Moniba. Malala missed her valley. As soon as she was well enough, Malala continued her campaign for peace and education. On her 16th birthday, she gave a speech at the United Nations headquarters in New York and received a standing ovation. In 2014, she became the youngest person to ever receive the Nobel Peace Prize. Way to go, sister! No doubt she would return to her beloved Swart Valley, but in the meantime, there's work to do. Although education is a basic human right, Millions are still missing out, especially girls. Malala wanted a first-rate education so she could fight more effectively for her cause, peace, education and happiness for all. Will you support Malala's cause? If you've watched this far, you probably already have. What else could you do to promote peace, education and happiness? Let's think about it over chapatis and tea. We hope you enjoyed this Schooling Online production. For more easy lessons, check out our other videos.